In late 2003, the Russian oil company Yukos suddenly found itself adrift. Its charismatic CEO, Mikhail Hartikovsky, had been arrested by former KGB agents in Siberia. The remaining company executives, in a hastily called meeting, tried to figure out what to do. Well, we really didn't have much of a choice as one of the largest oil companies in the world other than continuing to run it and implement our strategies. That's Bruce Missimore, the American executive Hartikovsky had hired a few years earlier to be Yukos' chief financial officer. Missimore and the other executives put together a plan to keep the company running, thinking that it was Hartikovsky personally that had drawn the ire of Russian President Vladimir Putin and the Russian government. But a couple of months later, they faced another bombshell. Of course, that didn't occur, and in December of 2003, they came after the company, too. I'm Lauren Steffi. Welcome to Episode 3 of Putin's Oil Heist, an insider's account of the Yukos affair told by former company executive Bruce Missimore. Today's episode, The Theft of Yukos. After his boss, Hartikovsky, was arrested, Missimore began to realize that his worst fears about working in Russia might be coming true. In the months after the arrest, it became clear that Russian President Vladimir Putin had no intention of allowing foreign executives like Missimore to keep running one of the country's biggest oil companies. In December of 2003, they levied some very, very large tax charges on us. So about a month and a half, two months later, I was in the U.S. Christmas vacation and again was shocked because we had just been meeting with Russian tax authorities, got a clean bill of health, and all of a sudden out of the blue comes this tax assessment, which eventually mushroomed to over 30-some billion dollars. Soon after his arrest, Hartikovsky worked to distance himself from Yukos. He was charged with stealing basically all the oil that Yukos shipped internationally, which was total bunk total lie. But they convicted him on it, even though it was a total lie. So he went to prison. He was battling on his own. But very shortly after he got arrested, he said, this is my problem. I am not going to pull the company into it. So he disposed to his partners of every single share that he owned in the company. So he no longer had any ownership. And and that was his attempt to keep the Russians away from the company. Well, of course, that didn't occur. Taxes were becoming Putin's weapon of choice for neutralizing political threats. And by 2003, he saw Hartikovsky as a political rival. Even before Hartikovsky's arrest, Yukos was facing growing inquiries from Russian tax authorities about whether it was paying the proper regional taxes. The Russian authorities had help in this effort from a large international banking company. We found out later that, interestingly, Deutsche Bank had been advising the Russian government on how to destroy Yukos. And their plan was to go after Yukos on questioning our regional taxes and the way that we did our Russian taxes, which we were very, very careful to be entirely within the law. The government began assessing taxes on Yukos going back four years, and the numbers kept growing, billions upon billions of dollars. And then subsequently, they came in with additional assessments for 2001, 2002, eventually 2003. And uh, all this was occurring in 2004. And as I said, some of the years, the tax assessments were in excess of gross revenue. So you can see that it was just all fake. American businesses have long been wary of the Russian court system and its connections to the Kremlin. Judges are appointed and serve at the mercy of the government officials who give them their jobs. Missimore and his colleagues, as they tried to fight the tax claims in court, found out that the system doesn't lend itself to a Western concept of justice. Every single assessment that we got, we tried to battle. However, you know, in the Russian courts, you're dealing with one hand behind your back. And of course, the concept of telephone justice, and we found that many, many times, where the judge would exit the courtroom, take a telephone call, and of course the telephone call was telling him how to rule. And so then he'd come back in and he'd do exactly what they told him because the Russian judges are paid virtually nothing. A way to destroy their lives is to not do what the telephone justice call tells them to do. And that's exactly the way justice works in Russia. So we were losing every case in Russia because the Kremlin was controlling every single case. 
In early 2004, the Kremlin stepped up the pressure against Yukos. In March of 2004, they froze our assets. So with the idea that they were going to take all of our money and pay the tax assessment with them. Despite the telephone justice, Miss Amor and his fellow Yukos executives kept fighting. But Russian prosecutors thwarted them at every turn. The tax cases included some 100,000 unorganized pieces of evidence, which they were given little time to review, and another 70,000 pages of exhibits. The Russian authorities had raided Yukos's offices and taken massive amounts of paper, and they wouldn't let us copy any of what they were taking. And they were taking lots of original documents. So, for instance, my accounting staff, the controllers, they had no original documents to support any of their accounting. The Russians took them all and would not let us copy them. So there were stacks and stacks and stacks of pages. And in, in one of the hearings, I remember, they presented them to us and gave us no time to review them at all. It was part of Russian justice's lay huge amounts of boxes and boxes and boxes of paper on us and gave us no time whatsoever to review what was in the boxes. And of course, they said, well, this is all condemning Yukos, and you know, it was all a lie. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Putin's Oil Heist. Eventually, Yukos was able to pay the first tax assessments by selling assets outside of Russia and dedicated almost all of the company's cash flow to the payment. And they didn't know what to do because we had paid the tax assessment. And all, all of a sudden, wait a minute, you know, you guys paid the tax assessment. You weren't supposed to do that. But we did. So they had really no case. And then the other cases were ongoing in the courts. But Miss Moore could see what was happening. The government was going to keep filing tax cases and keep the pressure on Yukos until there was nothing left of the company. He knew he needed to do something. But I felt an obligation to the shareholders. I felt an obligation to all the employees. I mean, I had directly or indirectly 5,000 people reporting to me. And so Yukos was a company of about 120,000 people. So you have all the people to consider. You have all the shareholders to consider. And we had done nothing wrong. Absolutely nothing wrong. Miss Amore decided to go on the offensive, at least as much as he could. And so I called one of our lawyers in at UCOS, an international lawyer, and I said, what can we do about this? We've got to protect our rights. We can't protect our rights in Russia. So how do we protect them? And he came up with the European Court of Human Rights. We hired a European Court of Human Rights specialist attorney in London and filed a case in April of 2004. I had to really work to convince my peers to do that because they were afraid we were going to irritate the Russian government. Does that sound familiar? Anyhow, we did it anyway, and I got the uh, agreement of the management committee of Yukos, and I and the attorney filed the case against Russia. And of course, that did surprise Russia. It probably didn't help our case at all, but at least we eventually ended up winning the case, and it got Russia's attention for sure. Amid all the legal wrangling, Yukos was sliding closer toward insolvency. Miss Amore had been ready to retire before he took the job. You might wonder, as I did, why he didn't simply leave at that point and return to a simpler life in Houston. And I am a battler when, you know, I'm accused of something that is totally a lie, which is what it was. And so uh, I stuck around. You know, I also had to battle for my own reputation because I had done nothing wrong and the company had done nothing wrong. So those were all considerations that went into, we need to stay and we need to battle this thing. But even as he was fighting, Miss Moore was well aware that what happened to his old boss, Hordakovsky, could happen to him. In fact, he'd even been told that he was personally under investigation by the prosecutor's office in Moscow. We were not naive, my wife and I. We had arranged for a German moving company. We gave him keys to the condo that we owned. We had removed all of our artwork and rugs and things that we had acquired that were things of pretty good value and put them at the moving company. And they had instructions if we ever had to leave on a moment's notice that they were to come in and move everything out of the apartment and ship it to us in the United States. 
Despite Ms. Amore's determination to fight, the company's bank accounts were frozen, and it couldn't pay to move some 19,000 tank cars full of oil around the Russian rail system. Export revenues plunged, and slowly, the company was drained of resources by the repeated tax levies and penalties. Author Thane Gustafsson, who wrote extensively about the Russian oil industry and the Yukos affair, summed it up this way. In Russia, there's an old saying that property undefended is soon claimed by others. The final straw came when Rosneft, the state-controlled oil giant, convinced a syndicate of lenders to force Yukos into bankruptcy using the loans that the banks had made to Yukos for oil export contracts. Rosneft went to the group of banks and said, you know, we want to put Yukos into bankruptcy, but you guys got to do it because Rosneft was not a creditor, whereas the banks were. And if you put Yukos into bankruptcy, we will buy all your loans at par, at face. You will not suffer a loss at all. And that's exactly what happened is Rosneft bought the banks out. The banks forced Yukos into bankruptcy as a creditor. Liquidation would follow a few years later. Yukos's assets would ultimately wind up in the hands of Rosneft and Gazprom, the two Russian state oil and gas entities. But we're getting a little ahead of the story. Because in 2004, Ms. Amore was still fighting to save Yukos. Then he took what turned out to be a very fortuitous trip to London. That may have saved him from the gulag, but he still wasn't ready to give up on Yukos and the dream that he and Mikhail Hartikovsky once shared for it. Be sure to tune in to our next episode, Fleeing Russia. She came in from Moscow. I came in from London. We met at the Houston airport, and we had kept our home in Houston, so we went back there. And then I started working with Fulbright and Jaworski, who had come up with an idea about how to bankrupt Yukos in the U.S., and that's exactly what we did. I'm Lauren Steffi. Join us next time for Episode 4 of Putin's Oil Heist.